Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, I Can't Believe It's Not Better seminar series, September 2022 edition. Uh, today, we're very happy to welcome um, Javier Gonzalez Hernandez uh, to, uh, to speak to us today, uh, who will be speaking about uh, machine learning systems not being better and his incredulity, incredulity at that fact. Uh, just as a little background, um, Javi Gonzalez is a principal researcher in the biological NLP slash real world evidence group um, at Health Futures Microsoft. Um, Javi works in machine learning methods for healthcare with a special focus on uncertainty quantification and causal inference for precision medicine. He's also worked at a variety of places prior uh, to Microsoft on a variety of problems, uh, which I am sure he's going to uh, some, share some anecdotes with, with us about today. Just a little um, note for housekeeping. Um, we are we do record these seminars and we put them on YouTube. Um, so yeah, you, if you need to leave early, you can always check out the recording later. Um, and uh, Javi is happy to take questions throughout the talk. Happy for this to be a sort of casual, interactive um, type thing. So uh, the uh, I can't believe it's not better crew will monitor the chat for your questions. And we'll also have, if time permits, uh, some discussion at the end with Javi. Um, so with that, I'll give it uh, to you, Javi. Thank you, thank you very much, Stephanie, and uh, everyone who is uh, organizing this uh, seminar series and also the, the the workshop that you have been organizing in the in Europe as well. I think you are doing an, uh, an amazing uh, work surfacing um, and uh, the problems that we have when we do science and when we do machine learning and, and, and modeling. And I'm very glad to be here, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy about uh, giving this talk. Um, uh, I hope uh, what I have prepared uh, fits in the spirit of, uh, of this uh, seminar series. And so the talk is not going to be technical at all, uh, but uh, what I really want to do is to share some anecdotes, reflections, and, and learnings about the uh, different projects in which I have been involved. And um, I want to share with you some of the things that didn't work and uh, what we learned from, from that. Um, and, and to highlight that sometimes when things don't work uh, is when, when, you, when, you, when, you learn the, when you learn the most. Uh, so the title is, I can't believe my machine learning system is not better. We are going to talk about systems in general for solving different type of real problems. And um, the reason why I have uh, machine learning there because uh, um, we will see how some of the uh, components of the, of the systems that I'm going to be describing have uh, um, a machine learning model or a statistical model that helps to, to solve the real, the real world problem. But uh, I, I want to highlight that most of the problems that I will be describing uh, don't really have to do with machine learning itself. It's had the, it, they have mainly to do with understanding the context of the problem in which we want to apply the, the, the methods or the, or the, or the, or the models that, that we build. Um, so this is a, an attempt to summarize uh, what we do in machine learning. Obviously, this is, uh, this is wrong in many, in many senses, but this is just, just as a, a summary. So when we do machine learning and uh, we want to do automated or, or assisted decision making, uh, so we typically have a, a, have a model uh, um, that, uh, that is based on some assumptions that we are making about how the world works. So the assumptions can be uh, assumptions about um, the class of functions that uh, we are we are going to feed to some data, or there can be causal assumptions about the data generation mechanisms that we that we want to learn about. We typically have some data, so we we combine these assumptions and these models with the with the data that we train. We use some compute. With the compute, we learn, we we can make some some predictions, right? And then uh, we can use those predictions or sometimes some parameters of the of the model to make decisions. Can be these decisions can be automated uh, or assisted. And sometimes we, we have a real, a real world uh, feedback loop in which we either collect more data, or we change the assumptions about, about our model. So we, we are doing automated decision making, for instance, when, you do, when we are doing Bayesian optimization, what we do, we use the predictions to make decisions about where to collect the new point that will tell me something about the, the, the minimum of the function that I'm trying to optimize, or a prediction can be a particular risk in which a patient uh, can uh, fall given some, some treatment, so we can use this um, uh, to assist uh, a doctor to make a, to make a decision. This is, this, is in, this is in general, and this encapsulates many of the things that we do in ML and, and in the statistics, but obviously when we think about um, machine learning in a, in a business context, we don't need to think only about how we build the model, we also need to think about how we integrate that model into a more complex system that involves uh, other steps and other, and other components. And those, uh, uh, this is a, 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 an example of a diagram that I took from, from that uh, 
web page, but there are many others if you if you, you look online. So the, 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 when we build um, when we build systems that have machine learning components, typically we have uh, to understand the problem. We have to ideate the system. We have to think about the role of a model in the system. Then we have to develop the model, validate to deploy it, and obviously. Uh, once the model is deployed, we need to be careful if the context in which the model is operating is changing. So we need to do some continual learning and we have to retrain the model and things like that. So uh, what I want to emphasize is that when we build systems that have machine learning components, things can get way more complex than the standard pipeline that, that, we, think, that we think about. But I'm really going to come back and for simplicity, I'm going to be talking today about three anecdotes that relates to these three uh, main blocks that I'm highlighting. So I'm going to talk about three anecdotes that I um, the, that I experienced in the in the in the past. Um, I selected these three because they relate to these three components of the of the pipeline that I have, I have uh, that I'm describing here. The first one is what can we what can go wrong with the with the data. Um, what can we wrong with the with the assumptions that we are making about the about the about how the world works and the implications that that have when, when we train our model, and also what can go wrong with the metric and with the decisions that we are making and whether we are using the right metric for the right problem, or or not. So now I'm going to jump into the three anecdotes. So the as a disclaimer, so the anecdotes are a combination of real anecdotes with results and, and some anecdotes that I'm which I'm. Kind of extracting uh, some experiences that I, that I have in the past and that I'm fantasizing for 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 a, for a better understanding of for simplicity. So let's just, let's start with anecdote one um, that tries to explain um, what happens when the assumptions that we are making are wrong, right? So and the, and this anecdote happened when we were trying to build a physical system for for experimentation. So this happened. A few years ago, I was uh, working in, in Groningen in the, in the Netherlands. So I was in a department of uh, mathematics and statistics, and we were collaborating with a department of system, system biology. Uh, we have a project in which we are trying to understand aging in yeast. So the, the, the reason why we were using this in yeast is because yeast is a unicellular organism. organism um, and it's, a, it's very easy for, to, to use yeast for this type of analysis because um, when, whenever we have a, a G cell and the G cell uh, replicates, it has what is called an asymmetric division. So we have the mother cell and then the, the daughter cell is like la, it's, it's, a, it's a smaller cell in, in size. So we can really distinguish, distinguish the two. And then we can count the, we can, we can think about aging in Gs uh, in two different ways. We can think about it in terms of how long the mother cell survived, which is around 72 hours in general. Or we can think about it by simply counting, counting the scars that we see in the surface of the, of the cells that corresponds to the number of daughter cells that this mother cell has. Right? So this is, this is the idea. And the idea is, well, um, if we can put the cells, a uh, uh, collection of G cell into, into a medium that is optimal and constant, Everything that is related to aging and why we have apoptosis or, or why the, the, the cells die should be related to something that is happening inside the cell. So if we do proteomics, metabolomics, and if we track the six, approximately 6,000 genes that uh, a G cell has, we can learn about the process of aging and, 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 and to learn about that. So um, the way experiments were done to study these type of things up uh, to um, after this, uh, after this work, was basically having having plates where some cells were located, and whenever the mother cell had a daughter cell, we were removing the, the daughter cell in the lab. So at the end of the certain time frame, we could get all the cells and do the and do the analysis for in the lab and extract the the, pro, the, the protein expression, the RNA expression, etc. So what this team in system biology did was something really really clever. So they design this microchip in which, um, which is uh, what they have in the, in, the, in the figures there, in which what they do is they, they, they created this super precise device in which they could start putting uh, G cells and the G cells were trapped in those holes that you see in figure B on the, on the left. So what was happening is that uh, this, this, uh, this microchip was embedded in a medium with some nutrients so whenever the mother cell was having a daughter cell, the daughter cell was flushed away. 
So only the mother cells after a certain period of time were, were retained there. This is important because if we don't do that, then when we do the proteomics, we have a mix of cells. So we want to keep only uh, the cells that we want to track for a particular time of period. So you, we can study, uh, you can study aging, right? So they, they created this device that was very novel, state of the art. And, um, and we wanted to, we want to, to publish and say, well, and tell the world, look, if you want to do uh, experiments with this, this is what you should do. Obviously, before publishing, uh, before building a system that uh, has this physical part with the, with the chip and that was tied to some software that could tell us in, immediately after the experiments were run, uh, aging, uh, insights about aging in this, we want to, we want to validate it, it. And for that, we used two well-known facts up to date that we knew about um, aging in this. So the first one is that when you take the G cells and you knock out certain genes, uh, that increases lifespan. Uh, so that's one thing. And the second thing is that when you put the G cells into a uh, calorie restriction conditions, so when you reduce the amount of uh, glucose that you would have in a standard case in the medium in which the, the cells are grown, that also increases lifespan. So these were two well-known facts um, about aging in genes that had been published in dozens and dozens of papers, both, both of them. So we had to chip and say, okay, let's run an experiment to, to, to validate that all devices is working. So the first thing we did was, okay, so we knock out certain genes, uh, we look at the lifespan, um, everything works as expected. So we are very happy, we are on the way, we can, we can publish this. Uh, people are going to start doing experiments with the, with, the, with the chip, right? And now we think about, okay, now, now let's do experiments reducing the, the glucose. And we see that things don't work. So basically we work with the YSBN6, that's the variant of the, of, the, of the G cell that is the standard for this experiment. And I perfectly remember how I was, how I was there in my office and, uh, and the biologists came with this figure and they told me, look, there's something wrong we should be doing with the statistical analysis when comparing these two survival curves, because it is well known that there is uh, uh, an effect in the lifespan of the cells when you reduce the glucose level. So we should be seeing something significant in this effect. There should be something wrong with the, with the data or the analysis that, that we are doing. So I look in the data and I didn't see anything strange, but you can see from those two uh, survival curves, the difference between those two conditions is not going to be significant. Uh, so we started to say, we can't believe this, this is not the whole why we are not observing this effect when in the experiments in which we are knocking out the genes, we actually can, can see that, that this is happening. This was, this was very interesting. So the first reaction that we had was, okay, so why don't we do more extreme experiments? So why don't we further uh, reduce the calorie restriction that we uh, use to grow the cells? So maybe we, we see we see an effect. So we do that. I think we're getting even worse because what is expected is when, when you reduce even more the glucose level, you will see a larger effect. So that wasn't happening. So this was, this was very intriguing. So now we say, okay, why don't we actually go and repeat for, for the same number of uh, cells that we are using with a microchip, because in the microchip you could, you could use a lot of cells. Why don't you, we repeat the original experiments with the plates and the needles, which are more expensive because it, it obviously it's, it's, a, it's a manual process. And we try to see if we, if we see any difference. The intriguing thing is that we see a, a small effect, but it wasn't significant enough. So it was really, really puzzling because this statement had been supported by many, by many papers in the in the literature, and we were not observing with the with the chip. So they say, "What? Well, what are we going to do?" So I was I was young and, and naive at the time. So I say, "Okay, so I'm sure that all these papers they have published uh, the the data that they have uh, used uh, for making this claim. So why don't we do a reanalysis of, of of all these papers and we do the analysis by ourselves and see what happened?" So interestingly, there was no data that was published. Or, or available, um, and there was a large debate. I remember about what to do next. So, luckily for us, because the data were not published, but 
the survival curves were present in, in all these papers, right? So there, there was this magic software, I don't remember the name, but it was a software in which you could basically take a, an image of the survival curve and start clicking on the, at the, at the points in which the survival curve changes. So you could actually digitalize and transform that into a data set that you, that the, into the data set that was used to, to, to generate that, that survival curve. So that's exactly what we do, what we did. And it was a, it was a massive amount of work. So basically we work with 41 different papers that were um, saying that the lifespan was increased uh, in the literature. I remember that this, this is some of the numbers of all the data that we digitalized. So we had approximately 27,000 cells. At the end of the day, we had like 200 lifespan curves that were basically all the data that had been produced in the literature about, about this, type of, this type of analysis. So just by itself, this data set was something very, very valuable. But the, the most interesting thing was what happened when we started looking into, into, into the data. So this is, a, this is an example from, from one of, of the papers. Um, this, was, this was very interesting because let me, let me explain you what, what happened here. So in this figure, we have three types of curves. So the horizontal axis is the number of bats, the number of scars that the, that the cells had. So this is like, a, like, the, like the time uh, scale in which we are, we are doing the analysis. The vertical axis is like in standard survival curve analysis, the, the fraction viable, the cells that survive up to a certain point. So what happened is that, and this is happening one, this, these are all the survival curves that were present in one single paper. So um, in that paper, they were analyzing multiple things, uh, including uh, a test about the effect of calorie restriction. So gray curves represent, gray curve and the black plane curve represent all the 2% slash standard conditions in which uh, cells are grown. And the dotted line represent the only curve in that paper that was computed with 0.5% uh, glucose in calorie restriction for the comparison. So the interesting thing is that not only that the, if, we, if you look at the whole distribution of curves, the, the one with the calorie restriction sit on top of the curves that you get from the standard conditions, it's also that the curve that was selected in that particular paper for the statistical comparison with the one with calorie restriction was the one on the lower end of the of the distribution, so it was this was very shocking. Uh, but the, the, what we question ourselves is like, well, was this something that was happening in general in the in the literature? Because there was clearly some selection bias in in the way the analysis were done in in, in this in this paper, or is this something particular of this paper, or is this something that? Is happening in general in the in the literature that can explain what what is going on with with our own analysis. So we did a reanalysis for the for the whole data set that we collected, and this is this is what we this is what we observe. So basically, on the left, what I have is each one of these points is representing a, a survival curve. The horizontal axis is representing the average replicative lifespan, right? And the vertical axis is representing the number of cells that were analyzed and are uh, in, in uh, to and, and that were used basically to compute that over its uh, replicative lifespan. Right. So two things uh, happen here. So the first one is that this is a like a final plot, right? So we really see how most of the studies uh, don't actually have too many cells; just a few of them uh, have. A very large number of cells, and the reason is that because running these experiments is very, very expensive, right? It's very expensive because you have to do them manually. So most of the analysis involving calorie restriction comparisons were analysis that has that had uh, very few data points. So gray points here and black points represent all two percent glucose, uh, which means uh, standard conditions for the cells, and white points represent calorie restriction experiments. So you see how in general, in the literature, there was a tendency to select curves in the lower end of the distribution of the standard conditions that were used to run the comparisons with the calorie restriction survival curves 
and that was leading to significant effects. What one you see is like, well, it's true that there is in the high in the in the high end of the of the of the distribution of the standard condition, but the effect is not as significant as as, as it would be if first you will be selecting really this. Uh, uh, these curves as, as, as random, or if you were doing the analysis with a large enough sample, sample size. So the, the figure on the right is representing uh, clearly that from the uh, standard conditions, from the 2% from the, from the glucose experiment, which is the standard condition, there's clearly a bimodal uh, behavior in the, in the data that you could clearly associate with curves that were used for calorie restriction experiments and curves that were used for completely different, for completely different, different experiments. So the, the question is what's the source of, of this, what the source of this bias, right? Why uh, these uh, uh, curves were selected like this? And it's actually a very, a very interesting because this even happened to us because we were talking to the students that were running the experiments in the, in the lab. And the problem is that, let's say that someone at some point got, with, got the effect and got the, this very nice narrative that, well, reducing the glucose in the medium, having a healthy diet is going to increase lifespan. Right? So the problem is that all the subsequent experiments that, that people were doing in different labs, in a way they were switching the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, if we want to think about this as a, as a hypothesis test, assuming that calorie restriction should exist, instead of running experiments trying to prove that actually calorie restriction exists. And the problem that the students described to us that was happening, and this happened with people in our own lab and people from other lab, is that because you are under pressure, you're running the, you're running the experiments and you know that this effect happens. If you run the experiment, which are which is very complex, right? There's a really complex experiments that involve uh, waking up at night and doing stuff to the cells. If you don't see an effect, the first thing that you think is that there was something wrong with the experiment that you were running. So you repeat the experiment until you see the until you see the effect. And because the difference is not that big, at the end, if you have run enough experiments, at some point you are going to find one in which you are going to see the effects and that's the one that you are, that you are going to publish. And this is, this is what was reflected in the, the meta-analysis that we did and became obvious to us when, when, we, did the, when we did the analysis the, this, this way. These are re results that we, that we published in PNAS and we, and we, and we published the, the data set. Obviously it wasn't easy to get this paper through uh, because it involved talking to many people in, in many labs. Uh, but uh, there was subsequent research that, that was done to verify uh, what was exactly the effect of calorie restriction in lifespan and revisiting the, the whole literature about the, about the state. So I think it was, a, it was really a, a, an interesting journey and a, and, a, and a shocking experiment. And we really learned a lot about that. Like, so the, the first thing that we learned that you really need to be uh, careful about the assumptions that you are that you are making right because uh, you may think that something is right but you shouldn't switch the null and the alternative hypothesis when when doing when doing your your analysis also the that the p values can be useless in the presence of uh, selection of selection bias you may think that you are explaining a mechanism when you when you are really not and obviously something that i think everyone in this forum knows is that reproducibility it's a problem. It's a, it's a problem in size, and whenever you can, you should publish your data so you don't have to have an army of students digitalizing the course to to learn about the to learn about this. So I don't know if there is any. This is the first anecdote. I don't know if there, if there is any any questions so far. I've got a question. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing in the chat, but. Uh, um, mm -hmm. So after after all of this, you know, meta analysis, you know, you sort of have to go, you know, it's a classic scientific rabbit hole kind of. You have to go and solve this problem. Did the uh, did the chip ever work out? The yeah, the chip, the chip worked the chip worked out. And one of the reasons why the chip worked out was because uh, in the chip you could run analysis for a few hundred of cells automatically, uh, which is something that uh, you cannot do. Uh, in the manual experiments in which you have cells in the plate and you have to start removing the cells with the with the needle. So I think the I think the the final 
a paper was published in Nature, something like that. Like a, this is it's like and using this type of chips became the standard approach to uh, to run this this experiment. Great. Um, I don't see any other. I don't see any questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so yeah, feel free to continue. Can you we may have more at the end. Oh, sorry. I cannot see people's hands up. Sorry. Go for Melanie. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. Quick question. I mean, this is more for discussion maybe later, but I wonder what can we do about this, right? Because this situation of, oh, okay, I'm not seeing what actually everybody is claiming outside. Uh, so I'll repeat. I mean, it's, you know, you're a PhD student or, 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 or researcher, you lack confidence, you repeat. I don't know. It's just so common. No? So what, what can we do? I don't know. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty common. I'm thinking in, in, in physical labs where these experiments are really, really expensive and it takes days. At a... So I remember there was a guy who was uh, doing experiments not with yeast because these experiments are like three or four days, but he was doing experiments with worms and he was uh, he was doing his postdoc and he was and, and the lifespan of the worm that he was using is about two years. So he had to be very, very careful about his worms because if they died, the, his whole uh, postdoc is, is wrong, basically. So particularly when you have experiments that are so expensive and so risky, this is this is particularly relevant, I think. Thanks. Okay. I mean, we can we can talk about this uh, later in the in the discussion as well. Um, let me let me jump to the second anecdote. Um, so the second one is a. Uh, so what happened when we believe that the data set that we are using exists, but it, it actually doesn't. Uh, so this is uh, in the context of some of the work that we are doing uh, at the moment. Um, so uh, let me give you a bit of an introduction of uh, what precision medicine is and, and what it means. Um, so when we, when we have drugs in the market, they are typically drugs that have been approved uh, uh, via randomized control, randomized control trial. So they, it's not they work for a, for a population, but the, uh, the, the metrics that are used from randomized control trial are, are, are populational metrics for the population that satisfy the eligibility criteria of the trial. So obviously then when you apply the drug in the real world, you can have a mixed type of result. Um, so what, uh, where, uh, pre, uh, pre, where every, everything is moving at the moment is towards a more precision medicine model in which uh, rather than having a way of doing healthcare that is uh, drug centric, is a uh, patient centric in which we use all the information that we have about the, about the patients to assist in how we can give a, a, a precision treatment that is specifically designed for that patient, so we can make sure that uh, the treatment the treatment works. So uh, the, one of the reasons why we can we can do this now and we couldn't do it a, a few years back is um, because the level of digitalization in hospital and this is a this is a figure that shows a projection of um, the amount of hospitals in the U.S using electronic health records or having databases about the patients and, and different patient characteristics and, and treatments uh, in, 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 the, in the hospitals, right? So the, the reason is like, oh, this information is digitalized in the hospital, so we can uh, build models with this information that could inform uh, better uh, clinical, clinical practice and better use of, of, of existing of existing. So when we think about this in terms of a, of a system, uh, we can think about having something that is using that is using data, and this is is, is providing insights about how drugs uh, can be can be used. And this is an animation that uh, Pratik uh, Ghosh, who is a designer in the, the team, uh, did uh, as, a, as a as an inspiration for for some of the things that, that we are doing. So in this case, but when we think about about precision medicine, we start thinking about well, we have data from randomized controlled trials that are, that are used to approve drugs. And now we have what um, of people in pharma call real world data. Real world data is simply data that hasn't been randomized. So data that you can collect from, uh, um, from, clinical, from clinical practice, right? And now we have these two sources of, of information. Um, they, they can be complementary, but they have their own characteristics for us and cause, right? So the good thing about randomized control trials is because everything is randomized. So the analysis that you have to do to estimate the effect of the drugs in the response of the patient is, is actually very simple because, uh, because of the randomization. When you work with real world data, you need to build causal models that uh, will um, uh, the bias the data, uh, the, the bias the data that you have, if you really want to, to compute effects. Uh, real world data also has more patient diversity. So you can 
uh, analyze a larger, a larger, a larger population. Uh, you typically have larger uh, sample size as well. Is uh, easier to collect because in, in hospitals where everything is digitalized, uh, you are collecting data not for free, but um, compared to the to the price that you have to pay in randomized control trial to collect the data is relatively small. Also, you can be collecting data all the time. And um, one um, pro uh, about a randomized control trial is that they are the gold standard for regulatory validity. Uh, but uh, in terms of real world data, although it's increasing uh, uh, increasingly more accepted, um, it's still it's still very low. So the question here is like, okay, so we have electronic medical records, uh, let's say tabular data that this has been already a structure in the hospitals, like things like age, uh, type of patients, some of the symptoms that you uh, that you have. We can run models and we can try to um, see if those match the randomized control trial, right? So, and people have been doing that already for, for many years, but what I brought here is uh, the results of this meta-analysis from this from this paper that I that I that I have in the in the screen. This was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, and um, which what they are, they do is they look into the studies that were using already structured data in the hospitals to build models, um, and they compare the hazard ratios uh, that they were extracting from those models to hazard ratio in uh, equivalent clinical trials, and they this this in a very systematic manner um, in the sense that the eligibility criteria that uh, were used in the observational study were the same as the one used in the in the clinical trial. And this is what they observed. So basically, if you look at the figure on the right, uh, what you see in gray is the confidence intervals that you get from the randomized control trials. And these uh, were treatments that were comparing uh, cancer treatments, right? These were uh, um, experiments that were comparing cancer treatments. So in gray, what you have is um, the, the result from the randomized control trial. And the dots represent the observational results from the analysis. Um, and depending on the color, you see those that sit within the confidence interval of the trial and those that sit outside. And on the left, what you have is just a simple correlation analysis of how the two quantities uh, match, right? So the one reported by the trial and the one reported by the observational study. So you see that some of these points sit within the confidence interval, but many of them don't. Um, so the question is, well, this is there is clearly something that is not working here, right? We, do, we would like to see a more consistent result when we look at, at, at these two uh, different, different analyses. It turns out that when you think carefully about why this shouldn't work, so what you think about is not really, um, I can't believe it's not better, what you really come to the conclusion is, oh, I can't believe why this is not even worse, because there are multiple reasons why there may be a mismatch between the analysis that you have from the electronic health records and the results of previously published trials. So obviously the, the lack of randomization is one of the, of the, of the reasons. So uh, uh, com, uh, correcting for confounding effects may be something very, very, hard, very hard to do. A small sample size, noise in the data, uh, different background population. So even if you have the same eligibility criteria, the, the, the distribution of the background population can be different. And the hazard ratio is an aggregated quantity. So that may affect that. Uh, and also that, um, uh, uh, patient data is, is always changing all the time, where um, when you think about randomized control trial, they are conducted at certain time point, and it's something that is more static, although well, you are obviously doing a, a follow-up of the, of the data. And I'm, I'm going to focus on one of the issues, which is actually what happens when you are not using the correct data. Most of those analyses that I saw in the previous figure were done with um, tabular data that were already available in the in the hospitals, right? But it turns out that most of the important information that you need to emulate a randomized control trial is not in the data that is already structured in the electronic medical record, it's in something that is digitalized but is way harder to handle, uh, which is the uh, free text that uh, you can get for medical notes or reports or, or things like that. And just to give you an example of the value of that and why this is a problem and why those studies were in a way using the wrong data set because they were not using the, the free text. 
Um, so there was this company called Flatiron Health. Flatiron Health hired about 1,000 uh, curators that were specialized and trained to read electronic medical records and transform that text into a table that could be used for doing this type, this type of analysis. And to give you an idea of, of the value of this data set that extracted manually information from the, from the, from the free text in the hospital, uh, Roche, the pharmaceutical company, paid about almost $2 billion uh, for this company and this, and, this army, and this army of creators. So now, so what happens when you use uh, the information that you get from the electronic medical records when trying to emulate previously um, uh, run trials. So I, I'm, I'm giving, the, there are more examples, but I'm, I'm, I brought here two figures from the two papers that you have on the screen. So the one on the left is actually using the Flatiron data set. So what they did is they use the information that was manually extracted from the electronic medical records to emulate the trials. And you can see the consistency there. So on the figure on the right, what I'm showing is a, a figure from this paper over here. What they do is, they combine structured data sets with a very simple representation, TF, IDF representation of the medical notes. And what they try to do is to extract relevant confounders that should be using the causal models that are used to compute the, the, the hazard ratio. And I really like this figure because this really illustrates the point of uh, how previous studies were actually missing uh, some of the relevant data that was there but was not usable. Uh, because what they do is they use three different three different models. So the vertical line represents the um, the result from the randomized controlled trial they're combining with, and they have three different models. And they have these three models trained also all, only in the structure data set, and the models trained only in the uh, data stack uh, uh, in the information structures from the text and in the combination of the of the two. So in this case, using the right data set that wasn't previously accessible, uh, but now it is, it's really a game changer in how uh, the trials can be, can be emulated. And now just, uh, so as, a, um, as a Stephanie was the same, I'm part of the biomedical NLP group. And obviously we have also tools uh, that uh, allow to structure uh, using NLP a structure uh, electronic medical records into, into something that is that is usable. And this is just a, a recent paper from the from, from the team. So what are the, the take-home messages here? Is like first of all, when we think about the standard machine learning pipeline, we think about the data set that is static, but the data set in the really static is really changing. So having ways of continuously extracting the data set and making sure that we uh, have access to all possible information, particularly when we when we build causal models, is a is a is a key aspect of it. Um, also, causal reasoning and causal transportability is a really like a game changer in this uh, in this type of problems. Um, NLP can be very useful to to generate the the, the right data. So I just wanted to brought an, an example in which uh, we uh, in those analyses we thought we were using the right data, but we were not. Um, and the, uh, that was actually the key, the key of the, of the problem. So I don't know if there are, there are questions after, after this one. Yes, um, um, Hans has a question. Hans, would you like to unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask it? If you can. Uh, sure. Uh, so my question is, um, you spoke about uh, averaging in the context of like precision health uh, to some extent. So. I want to ask, um, does the simulation and the control trials uh, create more outliers in general? And if they do, is that more uh, precision health um, based, um, like addressing it? And yeah. uh, so this this type of analysis, they they don't solve the precision bit. They don't, they don't solve the precision health bit. Um, but so let's say that you have a model that you that you have learned from electronic medical records, right? So you need to, because you are trying to estimate a causal effect, the effect of a, of a drug into different group of patients, right? What you need to do is to 
you need to externally validate that model, right? And that's 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 what these analyses are doing. So it's like, okay, I have observational data. I I, do, I I cannot possibly validate if I have the right confounders or not. I cannot draw a causal graph because uh, the problem is too complex for that. But I can compare the hazard ratio, which is the metric that I estimate with my model, with the metric that someone got before by an experiment that was completely randomized. And this is just a step to do uh, a retrospective analysis of the trial and validate the models that we have. But that doesn't solve precision medicine itself. But once you have gained confidence that you can use that model because it has validated by the result of an experiment like the trial, now you can start thinking about how to use it in the context of precision medicine. So now you can go uh, and use that model to generate counterfactuals for a particular patient, right? So now you have a patient with certain characteristics and if the model is well-built and validated, you can gain trust in the counterfactuals that you are, you are going to generate or some subpopulation analysis, if the, there is some heterogeneity in the treatment effects and, and things like that. So that's how things connect. So this exercise of emulating the trial it doesn't solve precision medicine, obviously. Nothing of this really solves precision medicine, but it's a, a step towards validating a model so you can use it for, for other things. Okay, I think, um, so uh, looking at other related metrics uh, is mm -hmm. what I got from the answer. Um, a related question, so is, um, is the clustering based on this data more uh, documentation dependent? So like, uh, are you dependent more on the types of records that are collected? So I saw some uh, Raj paid for the uh, people who collect the data. Mm -hmm. So so is the are the studies dependent more on the documentation, or is the scale large enough for you to for it to be gen generic enough that you don't need to worry about like uh, bias in terms of the data itself? That, uh, that that depends on the on the application and the and the trial you are trying to emulate and the and the question that you are that you are trying to answer and the data availability that you have. I think uh, in general that's that, that's very hard to to answer. Uh, the main point of of uh, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that well, using the text, it's really adding something to uh, using just the tabular data that was recorded in the in the hospital, but. For what you are saying, you would really need to look into the details of the specific application. Thank you so much. Cool. Uh, thanks, Hans, and happy for the um, answer. I have a I have a quick question um, before before we move on. I hope we're uh, okay for time still. Um, so, Javi, do you know anything about the sort of the the process that occurred where people noticed, okay, we're failing to replicate the RCT results using the structured data? Mm -hmm. NLP, you know, extracting extracting data from the unstructured um, part of the EHR is going to help us out. Like, do you know how people realize that's what that's what they were missing? I think that's a, that's very hard uh, because I imagine that there are cases in which that's the case, but there uh, may be cases in which it's not necessarily the case. I think the the um, I think the right way to go about this would be to to build a scenario in which we have observational data. Um, uh, equivalent randomized control trial that has been generated in the same environment. Uh, so we have access to both because in this type of analysis, the problem is that you have access to the hazard ratio, but that's a very aggregated quantity. You, you typically don't have access to the data of the, of the trial, right? Um, and then, so what happens is the, the, even when you do the matching and you have the eligibility criteria in both cases, the background population in, in the trial is different from the background population in the observational setting. Who knows what is going to happen? So I think what you need to do in those cases is to come up with a list, a very clear list of assumptions about what your model is doing. Think about which ones you can internally or externally validate and always to live with the uncertainty with the things that you don't have access to, I think. So that's why I think we need to be extremely careful when, when we do this analysis because as you say, it's, it's, it's really hard to know some, sometimes. Yeah, I guess it'd be very valuable to have the actual EHR from the hospital that was running the trial, exactly. so you get that parallel information. Great. Exactly. Um, okay, I'll let you move on. Um, if there, yeah, if there's more questions, people, you can post them in the chat. We can collect them at the end as well. Okay. Cool. So I'm going to move to the to the last anecdote. Um, uh, so. 
the thing about so what happens when we want to build a large automated decision system and so the the quote here is uh, what happened when you are solving actually the right the wrong problem that is associated to the to the wrong to the wrong metric so this is an imaginary uh, anecdote actually uh, so um, but I want to talk a bit about the microservices and how we build a machine learning system. So in the past, the way we were building uh, systems were this monolithic system that was a unique piece of software uh, that we had to maintain jointly, right? But um, the way we build systems has evolved in time. And now what the most companies do is actually when they build products, they build microservices. Uh, or they use microservices architectures that instead of being a, a, a monolithic piece of software, is a software that is composed of multiple microservices with very clear APIs that talk to each other and that are passing data and that are passing data to each other, right? And we could spend um, hours and hours talking about uh, microservices, but that's uh, that's kind of uh, that's kind of the idea. So what they want to say is that when we have this type of architectures. If some of the microservices are based on machine learning models, uh, the bitter lesson is that um, improving the model in the microservices may not necessarily improve the system, the system as a whole. And there are multiple causes why that can be happening, but I want to share uh, one of them with you. So, um, so uh, it's September, so it's the time of the Gaussian process summary school as well that we organize every year. Um, is happening at the moment. And what we do with the students in the Gaussian Process Summer School is we take them to a brewery uh, in which we had, uh, so in, we take them to a brewery in which um, uh, the, the, the people working in the brewery, they show them the process of, of making beer, right? And as you can imagine, when, when, when we are there, we're drinking beer and we're having some crazy ideas about research papers, I think what to do. But all that also, I remember in the past, triggered some very interesting thoughts about, okay, so if we wanted to build a service to automate the way we produce beer so we can maximize the, the benefits that we get for, for, for this particular brewery, how we will build a, a, a service, how we will build a, a, a software for that compose on multiple microservices, right? So now you can think about, okay, we decompose the, uh, the software that we that we want to build that will be a part of you know uh, we know the weather influence uh, the the way people drink beer when it's uh, hotter people drink more than when it's not so we we'll probably need a microservice that can predict the weather that can consume uh, weather forecasts from different services put them in a model and make a prediction and then that can be part of a demand forecasting service that inform how much uh, water and grain we can buy and that uh, we, we need to buy, and that can inform some other downstream uh, microservices uh, that will, at the end of the road, will make us uh, make good or bad decisions and make uh, more money or less money with the, with the beer that, that, that we are selling, right? Okay, so we, now we have our brewery, we have our, our microservices. Some of them are based on data and machine learning models. Some of them are based on rule-based models, right? Because it's just some business uh, logic that we are we're encoding there. But the idea is like, okay, we have a fantastic uh, a machine learning team that has been working on the uh, model that actually predicts the weather, right? So what we do is we talk to them and that team builds a model uh, that predicts the weather much better than the previous one that we had and it beats, it beats the previous one you know, the, you know, possible metrics. So what we do is we rewrite the microservice by injecting the new model that works much better in the classification uh, metrics for the uh, type of weather that we can have. We go, we deploy this new model into the microservice of the weather forecasting. And the surprise is that when we run the whole system, we wait for a, for a few months and we see that we start uh, losing money. So we replace the model by a better model. And downstream, what happens is that we are creating some damage to, to the system. And the reason is why uh, this is not working better. So why is this happening? So just very briefly, I just, I just want to share with you, and this is pretty much the, the, the whole anecdote, is why this can be happening. So when you build these microservices, one of the problems that you can have is that through this very clear API, things are uh, talking and, and connected to each other, right? So if you, and what happens is that there is sometimes some propagation of, of errors, 
and some compensation from, of error that systems are doing to each other, right? So the way I like explaining in this is like, so imagine that you have a friend, you like, you are a very punctual person, right? But you have a friend that is already late when you, when you meet. So after a few times you learn that your friend is going to be late, so you are, all, you are always going to be late to the, to the meetings just to compensate what you know is, is going to happen, right? But what happened is that if your friend suddenly start being on time, you won't meet because you, you will be the one that is late, so you will meet each other. So when you build microservices and when you build this type of architectures, um, that's the effect that happens when services are talking data and are talking to each other and are passing data to each other. And this happens because microservices are in, in general very easy to test locally, but evaluating how they impact the whole system is typically harder because it requires using the, the, the metrics from the, from, the whole, from the whole business, right? So the only way you can actually try to solve these problems is by having simulators of the whole system that allows you to uh, account for how uh, your metrics downstream are going to be affected by uh, the models that, uh, that you can use in the, in the, different, in the different components. So this is something that 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 happens. So uh, when, if you ever you are ever involved in, in in any of these problems, you always need to act locally because uh, there is no way you can holistically improve the system. You really need to improve your service because that's what you are expert about and that's what you what you know how to do. But you really need to take into account the effects that that has uh, down downstream, uh, which you can do by simulation. Something that is useful is how you can quantify uncertainty and propagate uncertainty through uh, complex pipelines. And that can help you to identify where, where are the bottlenecks. And also uh, something that is really nice about this type of uh, architecture is that because you have a clear API or components that are passing data to each other, uh, something you can do is have a causal representation of the whole system. And when something like this happens, you can do some, some root cause analysis. So these are the learnings from, 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 from this type of anecdote that I know it was a, a bit more abstract. Uh, but I would say that the, the, the biggest uh, learning is actually uh, to embrace failure and to, and to learn from it. Is, uh, th is, I think, easier to write a theory about success than to write a failure about uh, that, ri that writing uh, theory about failure. So that's what I've tried uh, to share some anecdotes about these examples that I, I experienced in the in the in the in the past or that I imagine. Um, so I hope this uh, this was be this was useful. So if you have any question and 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 you want to uh, chat a bit more about this, I'm I'm happy I'm happy to stay. Thanks so much, Javi. Um, yeah, awesome talk. Very much uh, in the spirit of I can't believe it's not better. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but people are clapping via Zoom. Um, mm. I have a I have a question about the um, the, the last anecdote. Um, so if one of the components of the system changes, could you sort of preemptively detect that this is happening by basically noticing that the distribution of outputs have, have changed? Like, could you use it? Could you protect against this by treating it more like a, you know, distribution shift detection problem? You can, but, uh, but the problem is that at some point is the one thing is building the system and the other one is, is deploying it. So the problem is that you don't really know what's going to happen until you, de until you deploy, unless you have made some assumptions about, about that. Um, is this, uh, it's like a, the, the diagram that I have at the beginning that says, well, things are way more complicated when it's not just about building the model and testing it in a local metric. When you are using a metric to evaluate your model, but this is part of a largest network that is evaluated on a different metric than how to transport from what is good in your local model and what is good for the global metric of the system. That's the, that's the tricky bit. And that, that is very um, system dependent, right? Depending on how has been built, how data is being passed. So you, yeah, there is, it's, it's hard to come up with a, with a generic answer for that. You really need to analyze and to understand what, what you have. Maybe an adversarial question then. Um, so it sort of seems like, you know, when you're dealing with a really complex system like that, maybe sort of the, the best way to find out that you've broken it is just run it and see 
Yeah. Okay, the outcome has broken. What if you're dealing with a very risk averse system like, let's say, healthcare or flying an airplane, somewhere where you really can't afford to actually run the system in its entirety? You have a you have a problem, and if you think about building an airplane, um, the way you build that airplane is basically in simulation. So you do CFD simulation. You know very well the dynamics of uh, the plane, so you you design the plane, you you run CFD experiments. Uh, nowadays, planes can fly uh, and being completely designed by a computer with a, with zero flying hours. But what you do is you run uh, some wind tunnel experiment that give you something that is closer to be flying, and then the flight is the flight. If something went wrong. The, the plane is not going to, but you expect, and that's the problem that we have in, in healthcare that it's very, very hard to have a simulation of a human body and how it's going to respond to, to, a, to a treatment, right? So that's a, that's a hard part of, of, of the type of work that, that we do. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Fran has a question, if you want to unmute. I do. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was really good. And I also th I think it fits the theme of the, of the, um, I can believe it's about it really well. Uh, yeah, I mean, just uh, for example, in the in the last part of the talk, you were talking about this uh, having the wrong metric. I'm not sure if I would say it's the wrong metric versus because it, yeah, so it seems to me like it's the right metric. But if if you are optimizing towards a system that is suboptimal mm -hmm. as a whole, yeah, just because of these compensations that you were talking about, it looks it looks to me like you might be falling into kind of some local mode. Uh, as a global system, but that is that is exactly. might be potentially very far from the global one. So, is there any other way in which you could, yeah, try to to optimize the the system? I, I understand that you might not be able to intervene on other microsystems, uh -huh. but uh, yeah, really, what, what... really, it's really hard. As a as a um, Stephanie was saying, it's like I mean, you need you, you need sim you need some form of you you can use some form of. Um, low fidelity simulation of the low system and try to see how your local metric is, is going to is going to work. Um, this raises the flag of how much you should be spending on improving your model. If you cannot really quantify how much you're going to improve the global system, because maybe it doesn't really matter. Maybe gaining a 5% accuracy in your in your ML model is having a so marginal effect, but you better do some something else, right? So there are so many interesting questions about how to do this. I, I find the topic really really fascinating because there are I think more questions than, than, than answers. But it's, it's really really hard problem. Yeah, I, I yeah no, I agree. I don't think that yeah maybe there's no like a general recipe for everyone, no? like yeah. Uh, yeah. And then along 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 the same lines, like I don't know, do you have any tips on how to diagnose what might be going wrong? Like uh, you share different I don't know. today, I think, like um, uh, yeah. I think um yeah, I think it's yeah, I think uh, it's it's about knowing that uh, you you will probably do things wrong, and just to embrace errors and. I think well. I think there is one thing which is um, which is building good experimentation systems that allow you to fail fast and move fast is a is a way that you can you can build with this, right? So it's kind of embracing that you are going to fail, that you are going to make make mistakes. So uh, you better make your mistakes as fast as possible, and you move on and you and you learn from them. I think that's the main general lesson that I think we can learn. So the more you can experiment, the better. So I think as a someone, people who want to learn what is the best thing to do and to learn about how the world uh, works, uh, the, the more experimentation that we do, the faster we do that experimentation, the most accurate that experimentation is, so we can get fast conclusions, the better, that, that's what I would say. And in the context of designing big systems, I, th I think that also applies, right? Um, Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Okay, yeah, no, I think this is a great uh, yeah message. Yeah, thank you. 
Thanks, Javi. Thanks, Fran, for the question. Um, we are at time, um, so um, we'll wrap it up shortly. Um, but yeah, this has been a great discussion. If you're interested in further discussions along these lines, remember that the I Can't Believe It's Not Better initiative has a workshop at NeurIPS this year where there will be ample opportunity to have such interesting discussions with other people. Uh, we also have a mailing list, uh, which you can sign up to. The link has been put in uh, Zoom. Uh, the next seminar will be on the 20th of October um, with Maria Vladimirova, who will be talking about um, heavy tails in Bayesian neural networks. Um, expectation versus reality. Uh, so uh, the registration link for that will go up uh, relatively soon if you're interested. Um, you can also suggest speakers for the seminar series. We're always trying to sort of diversify the universe of speakers that we have. So it's not just um, organizers, uh, you know, people that we happen to know or anything. Um, there's a link for that as well. Um, so with that, I'd like I'd like to, uh, oh, sorry, I just saw Melanie has a remark. Yes, uh, there's a very, very cool talk from Bob Williamson from our last NeurIPS workshop, which is available, uh, I think it's on Slides Live, um, which is really interesting. And uh, similar to Javi's talk, it captures some of the spirit of I can't believe it's not better. Um, so with that, uh, thanks again, Javi. I think this was an awesome talk, very much in the spirit. Um, yeah, we really appreciate uh, all of your anecdotes and learnings. Thank thanks you. Again. Uh, thank thanks you. everyone.